Dean Martin Celebrity Roast, coming to you from the MGM Grand Hotel in the entertainment capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada. The glittering city of excitement and laughter provides the scintillating backdrop for tonight's star-studded roast. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Ziegfeld Room, some of the world's greatest entertainers are here tonight. They're in Las Vegas in person as Dean Martin honors our woman of the hour, Angie Dickinson. With tonight's guests, Jimmy Stewart, Earl Holloman, Julia Krauss, Cindy Williams, Red Button, Jimmy Walker, LaWanda Page, Kathy Rigby, Joey Bishop, Rex Reed, Foster Brooks, Eve Arden, Jackie Mason, Orson Welles, Scatman Crothers, and your Roastmaster, Dean Martin. With tonight's very special Woman of the Hour, Angie Dickinson. Tonight we are gathered at the beautiful um, Megham Hotel here <laughs> in Las Vegas to honor the most beautiful and popular cop in Hollywood. And Angie, you do look beautiful. Your hair, your eyes, your gown, and your bulletproof pantyhose. <laughs> this should be quite a night. This is the first time we've honored a lady who became famous cruising the streets. <laughs> In a car with a red light, yeah. As a teenager, Angie began to develop into the fine actress you know today. In fact, the boys in her high school class used to love to just sit and watch her develop. <laughs> well, Angie worked hard and became the big star she is today. However, playing a policewoman really ha had its effect on Angie's marriage. Every night when she and Bert Backrack got into bed, Angie turned to Bert and said, I'd like to read you your rights. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one of the funniest young guys in television, Mr. Jimmy Walker. Thank you, Dean. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> what, you know? <laughs> no, uh, we're here roasting Andy Dickinson, and she is very qualified for the role that she plays on Police Woman. She plays a cop named Pepper, and she's got a great shake-up. <laughs> Only a problem is that everybody wants to take the law into their own hands. <laughs> no. And Angie says she likes her men tall, dark, and handsome. I can't believe she hasn't asked me out yet. <laughs> and I watch Police Woman all the time, all the time. I dig the shows where she wears them disguises, you know, so people won't know she was a cop and everything like that. There was one where she wore this skimpy little bikini, you know, it's really one of those little skimpy ones. One sneeze would have blown to a whole cover. <laughs> And Earl Holliman and, and, and Angie make a tremendous team. They, like, they were going to raid this massage parlor one time, and, and Earl told Angie that he was going in first. And if he wasn't out in an hour, go back to the police station without him. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll never forget the story where, where, where Angie was disguised as a madam. And it was the first time she ever saved Earl. Saved him 50 bucks. <laughs> Yes, there's a most talented young lady, Cindy Williams. Uh, we did a picture together, but we don't want to talk about no, that because it wasn't that they didn't release it. This thing escaped. <laughs> there's a funny little gal, and boy, she's got a lot of vim and some vigor, too. Miss Cindy Williams. 
William. Um, I'd like to begin with a funny little story that happened to Angie last night here in the hotel. It seems she called down to room service and ordered up a tall, cool one filled with gin and ice, and they carried Dean up to her room. <laughs> Aside, I've been a fan of Dean's all my life, and I think, I think you look terrific. Doesn't he look terrific? I mean, isn't it just amazing what an embalmer can do? <laughs> but enough, enough about people with talent. We're here to talk about Angie. <laughs> and all kidding aside, I could go on for hours about television's first lady, about her beauty, her talent, her humanity. But it seems silly to talk about Mary Tyler Moore when we're here to honor this bimbo. <laughs> Dear girl, you poor thing. But I've done some snooping around and I have gathered a few little known facts about Angie Dickinson. Recently, Angie was investigated by the FBI for going around saying that Jimmy Carter and Nipsey Russell share the same set of teeth. <laughs> is a little fact that no one has ever known about Angie because she's extremely sensitive and modest about it. But this woman is so generous that she donates her free time, yes, what precious free time she has, to giving acting lessons to Charlie's Angels. I think that's... <laughs> Earl Holloman plays the part of Sergeant Bill Crowley, that tough cop who rides around in the front seat of the patrol car with Angie Dickinson. He may be tough, but he's not too bright. If I was with Angie in a car, we'd be riding in the back seat. <laughs> a fine actor, a fine gentleman, Mr. Earl Holloman. Listen, this is a big pleasure for me because uh, the first part I ever played in the movie, I played an elevator operator. It was a Dean Martin picture called Scared Stiff. I remember well, I was scared and he was stiff. <laughs> but I remember what he said to me as he stepped into the elevator. He said, take me to the airport and step on it. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I, I suspected that Dean uh, had a little drinking problem even then because on elevators, you know, most people face the front, not the ceiling. <laughs> but, uh, of course, we're here tonight not to talk about Dean. We're here to... Well, I'm here to talk about the sexiest cop on TV. But since Telus of Alice couldn't make it... <laughs> Before our policewoman show... Angie and I had never worked together, but we didn't know each other slightly. See, Angie is an animal lover, and I'm president of an organization called Actors and Others for Animals. And we try to find homes for animals that nobody wants. And that's how Angie came to our first meeting. She was trying to find a home for Don Rickles. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't until we started to do the series that we really got to know each other well. And I, I want to tell you, I know her very well, and I guarantee you, this is no dumb blonde. I know, because I've seen her roots. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> Angie likes to research her job. She goes down, she hangs around the local police stations, the actual police stations. Of course, there's a lot of... There's a lot of raunchy stories, a lot of full-letter words. But I guess the cops have heard all that stuff before. <laughs> Sweetheart, I love you. You know I do. Crazy about you. It's funny, every place I go around this country, people say, what's it like to work with Angie Dickinson? Gee, what's it like to work with Angie? Well, I gotta tell you guys, it's hard. <laughs> Ladies and 
and gentlemen, a guy who never gets a dinner, Red Button! It's a pleasure to be here, ladies and gentlemen, at this roast. Oh, the Emmy tonight. is coming out. Yeah. <laughs> it is a pleasure. And as I stand here tonight, looking at you, Angie Dickinson, two things are running through my mind. <laughs> the second one is... <laughs> why are we giving a dinner? Why are we giving a dinner for Angie Dickinson? <laughs> Some of the biggest people in the history, in the history of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Never got a dinner Never The biggies I mean the biggies Dracula Dracula who said As they drove a wooden stake Through his heart I hope it's just gas Never got a dinner Captain Bly Captain Bly, who said to Mr. Christian, first we'll have the whipping, then we'll play shuffleboard. <laughs> Rip Van Winkle, Rip Van Winkle, who said to his wife after sleeping 20 years, fine thing, now that I'm all rested up, you got a headache. <laughs> Tell son Telly. <laughs> That's a thing. Telly, a short, bald headed kid. William Tell's son, who said to William as his father aimed at the apple. There must be an easier way to kill worms. <laughs> Never got a dinner. The leading lady in King Kong, who said to Kong. That's the last time I sign up for computer dating. <laughs> Never got a dinner, Billy Carter, who said to his brother Jimmy, I forgot to register. <laughs> I've never had an opportunity to say this. I'm going to say this now. <laughs> How about a crush on you? For years. I mean for years. The one thing you can do for me, which will be the culmination of my entire illustrious career, may I have a kiss. May I have a kiss in full view of this audience. Is that the joke? Never kiss a cop on the mouth. Jackie Mason, and he's beautiful. Beautiful. How are you? Well, <laughs> certainly a thrill to see me again. And I'm very happy for Angie having the opportunity to see me in person. <laughs> I finally showed up as a personal favor to her because this girl has been in love with me for years. Thank God I kept it quiet. I'm not like that piano player with a big mouth. <laughs> about me, about me, nobody knows because I feel if she's in love with me, it's nobody's business. <laughs> I never told nobody. I never even told her. <laughs> it wasn't even supposed to be a show in her honor. She couldn't figure out another way how to get close to me. Her husband knows about our relationship. <laughs> you notice he's not here? <laughs> he never goes in the same room when I'm with her together. <laughs> I'll tell you something about her show. I don't know if you got time to listen. You might be busy too. 
She's got a great show. A lot of people like it. I don't know who they are. <laughs> On all these television shows, I notice that they catch every crook in a second. And all the policemen and all the police departments all over America can't catch one crook. And they're at it all their lives. As soon as a guy gets a television show, he catches any crook he wants. I see if we could get the police departments out of the police stations and onto television, there would be no crime in this whole country. And... Everything on television is either violence or sex. Why don't they call music, for instance? How often do you hear about music on television? Don't you think music is more important than sex? I mean, for a man in your condition. <laughs> Don't fall asleep while I'm talking. <laughs> I think music is more important than sex. I always thought so. Then I found out a strange thing, that if I don't hear a concert for a year and a half, it don't bother me. <laughs> First of all, sex is life. What are they ashamed of? Well, let's be honest about it. Isn't sex life? Without sex, would you be here? Huh? I think you would. It's always a privilege to have Jimmy Stewart at these clam bakes, not just because he's such a distinguished actor, but because I love to hear him talk. <laughs> he's so slow and easy on the draw. How slow is he, Dino? <laughs> How slow? Well, he's so slow that in his last picture with John Wayne, Jimmy Stewart played a doctor who had to tell the Duke that he had barely two weeks left to live. By the time Jimmy finished telling him, John Wayne only had two minutes left. <laughs> Here he is, the superstar, Mr. Jimmy Stewart. Oh. Uh, That's it, huh? <laughs> no, Dean, I, 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 I'd like to pay you a compliment. I, you, you, you look nifter you're in a black jacket than any burnt potato I've ever seen. <laughs> and, uh... Hello, Angie. Oh, right, right. I'm here tonight not only to uh, pay tribute to this uh, pretty young lady, but also to ap apologize her. Apologize to her. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I, uh, you see, the last time I saw Angie was over a year ago, and it was at a Hollywood uh, dinner dance. As a matter of fact, it was the Golden Globes Award. Uh, Angie won one of them, which was appropriate. No, she was sitting next to me, and uh, the band was, was playing this kind of deafening raucous and roll music. And, uh, raucous? The, 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 raucous and roll? Raucous. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the, the, the dance floor was so crowded, it, it, it looked like sardines packed in a can doing a fertility dance. <laughs> so, so I got to Angie. I said, dancing out there has just got to be a hassle. And she said, yes, I'd love to. <laughs> and so I shouted back, you'd love to what? And she said, I'd love to do the hustle. And before I knew it, she had me by the hand. We were out in the middle of the floor. Now, let me start by explaining that uh, the hustle is uh, a modern dance, and I'm not what you might call your typical hustler. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but if, if you're my age, you shouldn't dance at discotheques. Uh, you, you know, at our, at our time of life, <laughs> Dane, you know, 
It, our town? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it, is, it, isn't, uh, it isn't really dancing, you know, it's just committing suicide. <laughs> one joint at a time. <laughs> don't, don't, you, uh, don't you think so? Well, it, it depends on which joints you go to. <laughs> <laughs> they had a live young band at this dance that I was with uh, Angie. It was named, uh, named uh, Dow Jones and his Industrial Averages. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I appreciate good music, but, but I'm really not much for go-go dancing. Uh, most of my go-go's already gone. <laughs> You see, this, this thing about the hustle is you, you, start, you start out facing your partner and, and then you shuffle back and away a couple of steps and then you turn. And then you, you shuffle back and away again and then you turn and so forth. Well, I've got a rotten sense of direction and that night I remember I, I, I did a shuffle and uh, I found myself shuffling on it again and backing away. And then I found I, I was uh, alone. <laughs> I, I, I was outside in the parking lot. <laughs> I, I, I forgot to get them to stamp my hand. <laughs> They wouldn't let me in. So I went home. But uh, tonight, Angie, I, I just finally like to thank you for that dance. It was, it was awful nice. And next time I'll bring my Arthur Murray Foxtrot chart. <laughs> Okay, I love you, and I will always love you. I love you from the bottom of my heart. But. Now, I'm not going to roast you. I'm going to tell you what I do not like about your show. I do not appreciate the writing on the show. I saw one story, I did not believe it, saw it with my own eyes. The robber goes into the bank, says to the teller, give me your money. The teller gives him the money, okay? The teller stops on an alarm, steps down on it. The cops are there, this is genius. Took the money, went to another cage, opened up an account, and on the way out, they gave him a toaster. <laughs> Mr. Joe Bishy. Catman Crudder. I'm really happy to be here and meet the uh, lovely Angie Dickerson. Yeah, I'm a big fan of her show. But one thing, I think that uh, there's a little bit too much violence. I counted 36 shootings, 12 killings, 44 assaults, and 61 muggings. That was just the opening titles. <laughs> you know, as a garbage man, I believe if you want to find out about people, check their barrels. <laughs> Because you get a flash from the trash. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure picking up Angie's trash. She got the best shaped barrels in Beverly Hills. <laughs> it was a little different in my old neighborhood. Trash barrels didn't last five minutes. We used to put the garbage in a fancy box, put it on the porch, and wait for somebody to steal it. <laughs> Man, that was a bad neighborhood. Shabby, run down, and ugly. It was the worst shape than LaWanda Page. Hold on there, Turkey. 
A jockey was feeding it sugar. <laughs> you could push your face in batter and make gorilla cookies. <laughs> Man, nobody cares anything about you except using your head for bowling for dollars. <laughs> Bug off, sin here. I'm looking forward to my 40th birthday. Yeah, well, just keep on looking because you're going the wrong direction. <laughs> Women want men who have lived, honey. Well, I've lived, girl. What are you talking about? I've lived. I mean recently. <laughs> so long, sucker. Scott and Lawanda Page. Our vision viewers really love the way Angie Dickinson plays the part of Sergeant Pepper Anderson on Police Woman. But what do real police women think about it? Tonight, we have one of those police women with us to give her opinion. Sergeant Gladys Ormfee. being a policewoman. I'm going to tell everybody out there what a phony you are. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to bear my chest. I don't know about you folks, but I'm getting out of here. As for her, she gets a credit for making women cops famous. What does she know? I'm the real flatfoot. That ain't the only thing that's flat, baby. How last you do Latin lush? <laughs> and don't you just love the way that Angie Dickinson runs around in disguises all the time? Well, she's nothing. Zip, zero, zilch. In the police department, I'm known as the woman of a thousand faces. Now, why'd you bring that one? Just don't look down, help me. Now, let's get back to the blonde bamboozler. <laughs> She's pulling the wool over everybody's eyes. She's not a real cop. She just gets by on her body. You know, I went jogging with her the other day, and when she hung up her sweatshirt, sweatshirt. <laughs> <laughs> now, calm down, everybody makes mistakes. When she hung up her sweatshirt, it was still bouncing. <laughs> sex all the time to get choice assignments. The best cases. Me, they send to the airport to sniff packages. <laughs> and did you ever see her trying to trap a peeping Tom standing in front of a window in her lingerie? Well, it's not like that in real life, Angie. I tried it. <laughs> the peeping Tom crept up reached in and pulled down the window shade. <laughs> Let me look at her. Take away the blonde hair, the gorgeous face, and the sexy body, and what have you got? You. Portrayal 
policewoman on television without letting the public know what a real policeman feels and, and suffers for the long hours. The ever-present danger. My life on the line from moment to moment. But do I complain? No, I'm a dedicated public servant, protecting the citizens of this city. I've never asked for anything, and I've never received anything. I have something for you. Oh, really, Angie, what? A citation for overacting. <laughs> at how Angie Dickinson can go through those action scenes with all that violence and still come out unscratched with every hair in place. Well, there are two reasons. One, she's got a hell of a hairdresser, and the other reason is our next guest, Angie Dickinson's double. Thank you, Dean. Yeah. I know you all find it difficult in telling Angie and me apart. <laughs> That's why they picked me for her double. Because I look exactly like her. In the beginning. Before I chipped my tooth. <laughs> but I love this girl. For her, I'd climb the highest mountain. Sw swim. <laughs> the deepest river and jump from the tallest building, which I've done many times. <laughs> Without me, Angie Dickinson wouldn't be where she is today, alive. Here she is again, Miss Luanda. Hey, Luanda! Hey! Well, uh, thank you, Drano. It's Dino. Not the way your face is flushed. I'm so happy to be back on another celebrity roast. You know, there are three groups of guests that appear on these shows. One group comes on because they're personal friends of the guest of honor. And the second group comes on because they are wild and crazy. <laughs> then there's those guests like me who are here for one reason. They have a beautiful body. <laughs> I got it, honey. You ain't the only one, you know. <laughs> I happen to be uh, real good at body work, baby. Hmm. Well, you ain't gonna dent my fender. <laughs> Just cool down, you heavy breathing hunky. <laughs> it's a real privilege for me to be here tonight. <laughs> Standing between lovely and mean <laughs> and loaded and obscene. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my good buddy, a great genius, Mr. Orson Wells. The 
TV policewoman, Angie, you've been forced to descend into some pretty squalid areas. Did you ever dream you'd sink to this? <laughs> the MGM brand is very grand, but what are the rest of us? The male contingent is a sorry list of molting Mary Andrews, faded japesters, jaded jesters, and one obese and superannuated Shakespearean. <laughs> Ruth Buzzy, of course, is something else. Just what, I don't know, but something. <laughs> One can understand her feeling a certain animosity toward Angie. Ruth, after all, is a woman who has never defended her honor or had the opportunity. <laughs> Wasn't it Jimmy Walker, whose flashing wit was directed at Angie's frailty? This from a man so physically inconsequential that he has to bring along a friend to cast a shadow. <laughs> For the first five years of his life, his parents thought he was a clarinet. <laughs> and Earl Holloman, where does he get off? A man who developed a whole acting career on just three little words. Be careful, Pepper. Come now to a performer whose very name is the tip-off on the general tone of these proceedings. Red Buttons. That's not a name, it's a condition. <laughs> There's not a man at this table who hasn't, in the words of our great president, lusted for you in his heart. <laughs> We've all attempted the impossible. We've tried to put you down, and the truth is that none of us are up to it. Who is? Who can roast a rainbow or insult a perfect rose? Before Angie Dickinson took over the role of Sergeant Pepper Anderson, the police department assigned her their top instructor, Inspector Foster Brooks. <laughs> now, I'd like to turn my attention... I'd... <clears throat> I'd like to turn my attention to my favorite female, as far as Sar Sergeant Pooper. <laughs> I thought I I thought this young lady everything she knows, and and whenever I see her on on television, my chest swells with pride, and that goes double for her. <laughs> It's pretty obvious that Sergeant Peeper has great physical attributes. She looks, well, she's built like a brick precinct house. <laughs> I, thought, I taught, I taught Sergeant Pampers one of, <laughs> one of my old, old police tricks. Keep a gun, keep a gun strapped to your ankle. And that always worked well for her until one day she was, she was, she was disarmed by a midget mugger. <laughs> I really enjoy, enjoyed working with, with Sergeant Popo. Po po. During, during undercover training, we had a break up all massage par. <laughs> she went, she went in as a, she, she went in as a missile. <laughs> well, those people would grab you all over. <laughs> and I went in, I went in as, as a customer. I sol solved the case immediately. But I didn't tell you for two weeks. <laughs> you know? In all the time that Sergeant Pippin and I were together, she only did, she only did one thing wrong. I took her on our stakeout and told, told her to be careful. Make sure you don't expose yourself. 
Unfortunately, she, she did. And I forgot all about the case. <laughs> Our guest is a distinguished motion picture and television critic, Mr. Rex Reed. We asked Rex if he would take some time from his busy schedule and review our show tonight. <laughs> and here he is, our critic at large, Mr. Rex Reed. Actually, I, I would go anywhere to honor Angie Dickinson, the star of Police Woman. After all these years, Angie, you're finally paying for the sins of Rachel Cade. <laughs> <laughs> she looks radiant this evening, as always, of course. It's easy to look radiant when you're sitting across from a guy with a glow on. And as I survey the dais here, all these folks, it reminds me of a picture I just reviewed, The Voyage of the Damned. <laughs> as for the performances this evening, well, who could forget Earl Holloman, Angie's co-star? He provided one of the brightest spots of the evening, I'm pleased to note. It was a real crowd pleaser. It was the moment he sat down. <laughs> and the great Jimmy Stewart. Oh, wow. Jimmy won an Oscar in 1940 for the Philadelphia Story. And again this year, he will be appearing at the Academy Awards to try to finish his acceptance speech. <laughs> and I love red buttons. He, he delivered another great monologue with faultless timing. He started out slow and maintained that pace. <laughs> the lighting, actually, for the show uh, was serviceable, but it did leave something to be desired. The light should have been turned off, <laughs> especially when Ruth Buzzy came on. Luanda Page was the fashion hit of the evening. She was outfitted in a new line of ecology wear, a recycled hefty bag. <laughs> At the podium for a short turn, mercifully, was the talented Joey Bishop, America's most famous substitute host. And as usual, Joey brought along his stock in trade, substitute jokes. In just a few moments, we'll all witness that wonderful climactic moment when our lovely guest of honor will rise to thank all of her friends and express her gratitude. I just really can't wait for that moment. <laughs> We've been here so long, Angie thinks she's at the Emmy Awards. <laughs> but I just want you all to know that tomorrow morning, after this show is telecast to millions of people, and I show up at the Unemployment Bureau, I'm gonna be in some swell company. <laughs> It's time to meet the star of Police Woman, Angie Dickinson, our lady of the hour. I wish it could be spent with me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your favorite and mine, Miss Angie Dickinson. Thank you, Jimmy. Didn't you 
you know, here's my chance to respond to the dais, and I lost my police manual on how to handle derelicts. <laughs> really, the jokes you comedians told tonight, you should get your own show, Bomb Squad. <laughs> Let me see, uh, Red Buttons, I think we'll start with you. While you were up here, I couldn't help thinking it's incredible how far you've come with your nightclub and television career. You know, despite your obvious handicap, your movie career. <laughs> oh, do you know I can't go up here and tell yes, nasty things can. about my friends? Can you stand up and help me? I'll, I'll do anything you wish. Anything you sure. Anything, but I, I don't know if I can stand... Oh, yeah, I'll, I can stand up. <laughs> there, I made it. <laughs> what do you want me to do? What would you like to do? <laughs> Anything you want. Well, I don't know. I guess I'll just uh, thank my friends and you take it from there. Well, remember the famous words of Earl Scheib who once said to Angie Dickinson, you don't need a whole paint job, just let me touch up your body. <laughs> Speaking of bodies, that reminds me of Ruth Buzzy. I'm glad to see you here again, Ruth. <laughs> Take it, Dean. I, nobody knows this, but Ruth Buzzy once auditioned for the gold diggers. And the next day, the price of gold went down $10. <laughs> Scatman Crothers, you were funny tonight. Scatman drove up to Las Vegas in one of those new cars with an airbag in it. Low Wanda Page. <laughs> Next read, as a television and newspaper critic, you have no equal. That's true, Rex. You have no equal. Superiors, yes, but no equal. <laughs> and what an evening this has been for Eve Arden, our Miss Brooks. Yes, Miss Brooks. Finally reunited with her son, Foster. <laughs> Jimmy Walker, what can I say about you? You could say skinny. Uh, as Ed McMahon would say, how skinny is he? Fatten him up and you can use him for dental floss. <laughs> or if he had holes in his tuxedo, it'd look like a clarinet. Or I've seen more meat on a goose pimple. <laughs> I feel like I'm back with Jerry. <laughs> well, one of the reasons that I love doing Policewoman is, of course, Earl Holloman. Well, Earl Holloman must love playing a cop because uh, b before the show, he spent a, a half hour frisking Cindy Williams. <laughs> I love about Earl. He is so helpful. He's given so much of himself to others. And what he's left with isn't too thrilling. <laughs> Cindy Williams, thank you, thank you for coming. You know, on the Laverne and Shirley show, Cindy works in a brewery, so when she got up here yesterday, I took her for a tour through the wine country, my dressing room. <laughs> Rigby, I've admired you since you won that gold medal on the parallel bars. You know, Dean, you've really got to be some kind of athlete to work on those bars. I don't know. I, I, I've never been on bars, but I've been under a lot of them. <laughs> well, I guess that's about it. Out of jokes? No, out of booze. It's over. <laughs> Thank you.